Let's pray. Father, I pray you'd take my lips and use them, that you'd speak through them for your name's sake and for your glory. Amen. Well, we're continuing to, to look at Philippians, and in this passage, this uh, short few verses, I want to look at three things beginning with C. And the first thing is we see that Christ uh, is to be first that Christ and His gospel is to be first. Uh, and that's what we see in this passage, that not only does it say that for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, so that that brings us to what Paul says in another uh, of his letters, where it talks about that we're ambassadors for Christ, that we're acting on His behalf, but it also talks about that we live a life worthy of the gospel of Christ. In other words, that Christ and His gospel needs to be first and foremost in our lives. That's the thing that drives us to how we live our lives, by putting Christ first, that we recognize that He laid down His life for us. That's what we come to celebrate as we take communion, that He died for us, so that, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, so that we live for Him who died that He needs to be first in our lives, and that prioritizes the gospel and Christ over all things. How we use our money, how we use our time needs to be prioritized through God's priorities. We need to look at how we're doing things and what we're doing, and if Christ is not first, if we're not working for Him, then there's something wrong. We're told that when we labor in the Lord, that our labor is not in vain. That when we work, we shouldn't work as if we're working for men, but we should work as if we're working for the Lord. That that's what God desires of us. If it was simply that Jesus wanted us to be saved, and that was it, then after coming to Christ, we could simply just be taken away. Because if that's what it is about, just salvation, then surely once we give our lives to Christ, then we're saved and He could simply take us away. But Jesus wants to show the world what His kingdom would look like. And so the second thing is that we see conduct, that our conduct must be worthy of the gospel of Christ. And what we're seeing is that it's, it's not about how we live, but it's, it's forming us, it's formation for what's ahead. Uh, for those who've been coming along to the Bible study, we've been looking at Revelation. And it's clear in Revelation what's going to happen in terms of certain future events, that there will be a great tribulation, that for three and a half years, there's going to be great tribulation. And Jesus giving a letter to the churches is helping them to see what's ahead so that they would live in such a way that they would overcome. And we see time and time again when Jesus speaks to each of the churches, at the end of each letter, now if you want to know what it means to be a Christian and what you have as a Christian, Go through the seven letters that Jesus speaks to the, to the churches in those seven places, and look at what Jesus says to them at the end of each letter to the church, because He finishes off each one in the same way in terms of, He says, he who overcomes, he or she who overcomes, I will. And then He says, what's going to happen? And we see that in one of the letters, Jesus says, the one who overcomes, I will give a right to sit on the throne with me, just as I overcame and sat on my Father's throne. That we see Jesus talking about us reigning with Him. And what happens is that after the three and a half years of great tribulation that is forecast in Revelation, We have this event called Armageddon that people sort of think is a massive battle, but actually, as people come against 
Jesus and his people, we see them just in a word being dealt with. And then at that point, we see a thousand-year reign of Christ. If you look from Revelation 20, it talks about this thousand years of reign of Christ. So, Christ is coming back to reign on this earth, and that we will reign with Him, that Jesus will show the world what, it, what the kingdom looks like when it's on earth. So, when we pray the Lord's Prayer and we're saying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's what's ahead. The kingdom will be on earth, and people will see what it's like for Jesus to reign for a thousand years. But we will reign with Him for those who overcome. And Revelation tries to help Christians to be in that place where they will overcome, where they will stand, and at the end, Jesus will be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And when we think about what Jesus says in the parable of the talents, He says to the one who had five talents who made five more, He says that He'll put them in charge of ten cities. Do you think that was Jesus just talking in a riddle? Jesus is actually talking about literal things that when people use the gifts of God in the right way, when they are faithful to the end, when Jesus comes back and those who are dead in Christ will rise first, they will be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, but then they'll be coming down to reign with Christ for a thousand years. That what the life that we're living on this earth right now, if you're a Christian, is a preparation for that time when Christ will reign with us. Jesus wants to form a community that will truly reflect the kingdom. And so, that word, conduct yourselves, is what we actually get the word politics from. It's about responsibility. Now, we can see politics, they're not really responsible but we are meant to act as if we are citizens in heaven, which is what we are. And so, the Bible constantly talks about what our position is, and because of our position, it means that there should be a certain behavior. So, our position already, if you look at what Paul says, that we're seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. So, our position is that we are citizens of the kingdom of God. And if we're citizens of the kingdom, then our lives need to show that now. People want to see, and Jesus wants to see, that our lives are lived for His kingdom. He wants to see that the way that we treat each other, the way that we are towards each other, reflects that kingdom because that's what He's preparing us for. The third thing is content, that we need to recognize that we are in a fight, that we have an enemy, the devil, and that therefore when, when we know that Satan, his name means to oppose, that he wants to be there instead of. Antichrist means instead of. And so, Revelation talks about the Antichrist coming and performing miracles that will deceive people. We need to be those who clearly understand that there's a battle that's currently going on, and that when it comes to contending, Paul says, contend as one man for the faith of the gospel. It comes from that sense of an athlete. If you think about a boxer contending against someone else, and Paul wants us to have that sense of that we're not competing against each other, but we're competing against the enemy. And so, he's calling for unity, that we would be united, understanding that there's a common enemy, 
And if that enemy wants to defeat us, he will cause division. He'll cause us to act in a way which is not right. He'll cause us to go uh, and have our focus on things that are not of the kingdom. Whatever way he can cause us to, it'll either be through division or through compromise that we don't look what we should look like as a community of people of faith or that we're so divided that it's easy for him to win. And so Paul calls us to contend as one that we would be one in spirit. And so we need to be those who invite the Holy Spirit into our lives afresh every time, every day, so that He works in us to make every effort, as Paul says in Ephesians 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. That we need to recognize that we need to work together. That each of us have a role to play. That each of us are given gifts of the Spirit. And we need to use those gifts to build up the kingdom, to extend the kingdom in this world. We need to recognize that the world is trying to force the church and Christians into its mold. We need to recognize what is truth and stick to it. I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said to some people, a group of people, if there's a four-legged dog and you call the tail a leg, how many legs does the dog have? And people answered five. And he said, no, it's still got four legs. Calling a tail a leg doesn't make it a leg. You see? It's about truth. And what God calls truth and what God says is sin is sin. Just because some people say it's not doesn't make it not sin. We go with what the Word of God says and the truth of God, and we live in such a way that we're showing the world what the kingdom's like. You see, people are looking for something else other than what they're currently getting. And if the church simply goes the way of the world, they'll not see what the kingdom's like. We need to be those who recognize there's a battle going on. We need to be like those four by 100 relay uh, teams who we see working together. If they fail to reach the finish line, they fail together. They succeed and they fail as a team. We need to be those who contend as one for the faith of the gospel. We need to put Christ first because that's what He desires. That's why we're still here. We've got a work to do, the work of Christ to do. That needs to come above all things. doesn't mean to say that we all become pastors or rectors or, or missionaries, or whatever, but we have to see whatever we're doing as being we're doing it for Jesus. And then the kingdom will be seen in that. We need to be, understand that conduct. God wants to work in us to will and to act according to His good pleasure. He wants to see Christ in us more and more because of what's ahead, because of His rule and reign which will be seen on this earth in the future. We're being prepared for that. We need to understand that and be those who do overcome and who are able to have Jesus say to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Father, we want to pray that you'd help us, that, Lord, that we would grow in our relationship with you, that we wouldn't stagnate, but we would grow, that we'd grow in Christ-likeness, that we'd, uh, Lord, have that hunger and thirst for more of you, hunger and thirst to see your kingdom more in our area and in this world, that we'd rely on you more fully to work in our lives, to make us 
the people that you want us to be, that, Lord, you'd help us to contend as one for the faith of the gospel so that people would not just hear the good news, but they'd see the good news. We ask this in your name. Amen.